Welcome back to this special edition of 12 Days in March. Let's continue our discussion moving on to the Q-Banks. It would be pretentious to think that my view of the Q-Banks is a definitive proclamation. Rather, I plan to highlight how Q-Banks are a complementary tool for learning. In this section, you will see how they mesh with and reinforce the concepts that we've covered so far. So to remind you, our ultimate goal is the integration or consolidation of content so that you can become facile with the recall and application of previously reviewed material on test day. So the first thing we need to consider is this thought. What is the purpose of the QBank? You need to be able to answer this question before proceeding. It is the most important question you'll answer during step one preparation. And here it is with a dark background for dramatic effect. QBanks are for learning. They are not for testing. If you think they're for testing, you've missed the boat. And we know how that worked out for the crew and passengers on the SS Minnow. So just stop for a second and consider the basis of using questions in medical education. The answer, in educational parlance, is to create a problem-based learning exercise. And what's the big deal about problem-based learning? The big deal is this. By working through questions and problems, the student becomes actively engaged in the learning process with the buzz phrase being actively engaged. And by way of comparison, passive learning is that which takes place in the great lecture halls. With active learning, the student gains a greater understanding of material and a greater retention of information. So what's the purpose of QBanks? Through active problem-based learning, you will develop increased retention of information that is more readily available on test day. But to accomplish these goals, you need to use the QBanks effectively. And effectively doesn't mean motoring through 40 questions at a time testing yourself, as that approach will have predictable and dire consequences. Instead, the goal is one question at a time, managed correctly, to maximize learning efficiency and retention of content. All right, so the first take home is that QBanks are for problem-based learning, not testing. Recommendation two is to do them early and do them often. I know you are ridiculously busy during the school year, but if you can do some, not a ton, but some, you'll be ahead of the curve. The goal in doing them early is shown on my second bulleted point. You need to get early exposure to the NBME language, even in preference to content. Content is easy. You can get that anywhere, as in lectures and review manuals. It's language that drives students crazy. And that is underscored by one of my favorite student comments. I know the material, I just have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And that says it all. The NBME speaks a different language. One that seems to have nothing to do with the content that you were taught in class. And here is a simple and very realistic example demonstrating the language of COPD. You can be expert in your conceptual understanding, but unless you are fluent in the physical exam descriptors, the radiographic and pathophysiologic descriptions of hyperinflation, and or the pathologic language of the NBME, you won't do well on test day. Certainly there is overlap between content and language, but as you get started in the QBanks, you need to maintain a vigilant eye toward the unique language and descriptors of the NBME. And to be clear, your classes and review manuals do supply content, but the QBanks highlight how that content will be tested. Although this seems elementary, my dear Watson, you will be shocked to learn how different the two are. Content and how it is tested in NBME style vignettes are worlds apart. And just a quick sidebar, I would remind you the QBanks are cash generating businesses. They profit on your vulnerabilities and fears. And whereas their questions aren't always perfect, I think their biggest crime is the inclusion of esoteric and peripheral material. I refer to this low-yield material as Q-Bankisms. In time, you'll be able to readily identify Q-Bankisms. They are small points on topics you've never seen or heard of, and will get little play in your other resources such as first aid. So whereas I do encourage use of the Q-Banks to promote active learning, please be mindful that not every question and teaching point is of earthly importance. All right. Let's get into the best practices, and we'll start with the basics. I would highly advise you to kill the timer. There is a time for testing and a time for learning. If you are struggling, this is your time for learning, not testing. Kill the timer. I love the phrase, slow is the fastest way to get there. And when it comes to board preparation, nothing can be more truthful. As we've already highlighted, you are using the QBanks for learning, not testing. There is no timer on learning. 
You have a lot of information to extract, especially as you carefully refine your notes. Your goal is to practice iterating and reiterating those key associations. Of even greater importance, before completing a question, you'll go back to the question stem to study and really incorporate the language used to describe the disorder. So time questions will inhibit your intellectual expansion and retention of content. I'm obviously not a big fan of the timer. All I can say is speed kills. Take life slow and deliberately. FYI, you'll have ample opportunity for timed exams down the road. Shown here are the CBSSA exams offered by the NBME. Before all is said and done, students, on average, will do two to three of these exams. They will be timed. Okay, you killed the timer, so now we move on to the next step, creating the exam. Once you enter QBank, you'll be prompted to create your practice test. I highly encourage you to select one organ system at a time. This approach will maximize QBank value and efficiency, and you'll see why in a moment. You will next be prompted to select subdivisions such as anatomy, histology, etc. Please select only one subdivision at a time. And generally speaking, you should select physiology before pathophysiology, followed by pathology and ultimately pharmacology. You can do the other sections such as immunology, microbiology, etc. at your discretion, but keep physiology, pathophysiology, pathology, and pharmacology in sequence. And why is it so important to work within a single organ system and a single subdivision? The answer is repetition and reinforcement. The questions and concepts all serve to reinforce one another and ultimately your memories. Equally important are the recurring trends and patterns. As you bathe in cardiac pathophysiology, for instance, you will develop a clearer sense of the information coveted by the NBME. This is where and how students get a sense of high versus low yield materials. In terms of repetition and reinforcement, here's a really simple example. In pathophysiology, as you go through the cardiac cycle curves, you'll encounter a question on mitral stenosis. From that question, you'll learn about the left atrial pressure curve. Later on, as you continue in the pathophysiology section, you'll come across a question targeting mitral regurgitation. The question options will surely include mitral stenosis. This method allows you to reinforce the earlier lessons on mitral stenosis, helping to cement the previously learned material. This is such a healthy approach for our memory and for our brains. But compare and contrast that with an approach where you select random questions from random sections. In that scenario, it is likely that you'll be hopping from one question on the cardiac cycle curve to the brachial plexus. When that happens, game, set, match. You just lost. Not only do you miss out on the reinforcing lessons on mitral stenosis, but more likely than not, that information will disappear into a black hole as you try to absorb all the features of the brachial plexus. Random questions are a certain path to chaos and confusion. If you feel the need to do random questions, minimize your exposure. Do five, not 40. I do understand that step one is comprised of random questions, but we are not testing in the QBanks. We are learning. We are learning a new language. We are learning how the NBME views the same content you experienced in the amphitheaters, but does so in a unique and completely different manner. Not to worry, you'll have ample opportunity for randomized, timed exams down the road. And just as reinforcement is seen within subdivisions, staying within organ systems multiplies the benefits. After all, isn't pharmacology just applied pathophysiology? I think that's a rhetorical question. That's stupid on a video. Pharmacology definitely reinforces physiology and pathophysiology. So if you must do some random questions, then do them within a single organ system. At least then there is some chance that the material will be reinforcing. And finally, before moving ahead, if you are struggling with an organ system or subdivision, please go back to your primary learning sources. Relearning material from these sources is a wonderful and rewarding investment of your time. It is amazing how interesting the material becomes when motivated by the fear of failure. Continuing on to the next step, I need to highlight the notion and importance of only one question at a time. As this circles back to the previous principles discussed, the QBanks are for learning, not testing. And you have a tremendous amount to extract from each question, so let's take a deeper dive. To reiterate, you'll still prioritize the question stem with data analysis playing the central role. In questions where you are uncertain of a correct answer, you will still look at the options and ponder the typical associations. 
With these spelled out, you'll go back and further peruse the stem for what they told you and what they didn't. And here's the new twist. If struggling on a question, feel free to check your notes or other references. And you're like, Sax has gone off the deep edge. He's nuts. Did he really say we could check our notes? But that's right. I really said it. And here's the logic. First and foremost, in many instances, you were just one knowledge morsel away from excellence. It may be a very simple tidbit, but through the process of self-discovery, i.e. active learning, it is much more likely that the teaching point will actually be retained. That is, when you investigate the information, it is more likely that you'll remember compared to my telling you the same information nugget. It will be like adding a new ornament to your intellectual scaffolding. The other point is the notion that you're a lot closer than you think. Students get discouraged when they answer questions incorrectly. It brings out all kinds of self-doubt and uncertainty about your academic performance. But when you discover that there was one tiny point that stood between you and greatness, it restores your confidence. And again, the active educational exercise lifted that important content from the written page into your working memory. I can't say it enough, but active learning yields better long-term outcomes when it comes to recalling educational materials. So can you just answer the question without using references and then review the explanation? Sure you can, but that is a passive learning process. Long-term retention is simply better when you are actively involved in the problem solving and thereby take an active role in your own education. You are the one who needs to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It doesn't help if I tell you where to put the pieces. This is not a Sachs educational theory. This is borne out by dense education literature. You need to be actively engaged. So you've submitted your response and it passed the sniff test. What's next? You'll check the logic and teaching points associated with the correct response. Whereas you'll peruse the incorrect responses, you won't make these the main gist of the teaching exercise. That is, you need to link the vignette with the correct answer. If you spend too much time obsessing on the incorrect response, you'll lose the teaching moment. But to guard against diluting the important teaching message, go back and review the language of the stem. Do not go from the answer explanation to the next question. You need to squeeze out the appropriate high yield language or descriptors for the disorder. You need to make note of the key physical exam features and you need to digest the data, paying particular attention to how the data was linked to the clinical presentation. Now go back to your notes again and refine them again. The act of focusing on the typical and key associations will eventually morph complex principles into reproducible sound bites that come to reside in your working memory, especially on the high yield repetitive principles or disorders that the NBME so values. And finally, before advancing to your next question, feel free to lecture your pets or children or anyone who will listen. The act of talking out loud will reinforce your mastery of content. More importantly, and I see this over and over again in students struggling to bring a question across the finish line, I simply ask them to become my educator. That is, I become the student and they become the teacher. This exercise of describing a disorder to me, including presentation and typical data, renders the student instantly smarter and more insightful. It lends clarity. It reminds the student about how much they know rather than focusing on their deficiencies. Lecturing matters. That's where the adage comes from. See one, do one, teach one. The exercise transforms students from passive victims into engaged and scholarly superstars. And in the process, it educates Shakespeare, the world's smartest and most handsome pig. And here is a very busy summary of what we covered so far in the QBanks. These steps will deliver you to the precipice of greatness. So you're only ready to move on to the next question when you've incorporated the material from each question into the very essence of your being or the fabric of your soul. Now we all know that Sax can be a drama queen, but I would rather have you do one question and learn the material than 40 questions where you see a ton of material and retain nothing. Now of course that is over the top, but the goal is to create fond memories that you can carry into test day. So where are we? We're actually at the end. We're at the end because all the roads led right here to the integration of content. And how did that happen? Well, the first lesson that we all agreed to is that QBanks are for learning, not testing. The whole house of cards depends on this little nugget of information.
We learn the difference between active and passive learning and how active learning leads to improve retention of material. We learn that cue banks are not for testing and that they represent an educational tool referred to as problem-based learning, which is a form of active learning. We learn that the ultimate goal is to build your intellectual scaffolding so information will be readily available on test day. We learn that your notes do matter. We learn the importance of culling and refining them, focusing on classic associations and key language that will bail you out of clinical vignettes when the answers are not readily apparent. I've given you permission to reference your notes or other resources when you're in a jam. The process of exploring references during the act of problem solving leads to better retention of material while having the secondary benefit of helping you realize just how close you are to greatness. We entered the cue bank and discovered the reinforcing benefits of one organ system at a time and one subdivision at a time. We looked at the folly and chaos of doing random questions and how randomness interferes with the cementing of knowledge. We looked at the importance of note-taking and the reinforcing benefits of the student becoming the educator, lecturing to your pets or anyone else that will listen. And by the way, this is Shakespeare. And he loves to listen to medical lectures, especially when delivered by medical students preparing for step one. We took a deep dive into the question stem and spent a good deal of time weighing the relative merits of data, demographics, and the physical exam. We focused on the importance of the NBME language even over content. That is, you can be very familiar with content, but if you can't speak the language of the NBME, you'll be dead in the water. We talked about negative information and how the absence of findings and or information can actually be quite informative. And finally, we spoke about the pace and rhythm of question review in order to maximize the efficiency and value you derive from the use of the cue banks. We emphasize the most important mantra, one question at a time. And if you pay attention to the key concepts buried in these videos, you will integrate abundant amounts of information that will be readily available at your fingertips, and you too can score 260 on test day, not because of some miracle or supernatural event, but because you worked your tails off, but did it with focus and efficiency. And that, my friends, is how the game is played. And with that, I will let you know there are always more pearls, pitfalls, and lessons, but this material should keep you busy for a while. Like I mentioned in the beginning, maybe these lessons are more useful in the context of one-on-one -on -one sessions, but with luck and diligence, I do hope you folks can develop mastery of NBME vignettes, freeing up some time for memorization of mutations, biochemistry, and the other junk that makes up the remainder of the Step 1 exam. And with that, I'll sign off wishing you well. Please let me know if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of the material presented in this series. Thank you.